Did you know that, like my mother said, God wrote the story of your life before the foundation of the world? I say all this in review, and I'll get to my message in a moment. Listen to these scriptures. Revelation 17, 8, whose names were not written in the book of life before the foundation of the world. That simply means that there are some people in our world, on our planet, whose names were written, and by name, it's a Hebrew word that, that uh, and a Greek word, both Hebrew and Greek, would, would mean the same thing. It's not just your name, Tommy or Mark or Bet, Betty or, or Wanda. It means your life, your destiny, your purpose, who you are, what you're to be, your name, who you are, was written before the foundation of the world. Listen to this scripture. It's found in Hebrews chapter 4, 3. Our works were finished, accomplished, before the foundation of the world. Ephesians 1, 4 and 2, 10. He has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. For we're his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works that God prepared before the world began. Do you know how important that is? Do you realize that's why Moses, when he stood before the Red Sea, his destiny, his purpose that was written by God before the foundation of the world, before the sun was made, before the Red Sea was made, that was written. So when his destiny is on the other side, the molecules and the stuff of which the Red Sea is made is no combatant for his destiny. So when he touches the Red Sea, it rolls back. Joshua is destined by God to win the victory over Ai. But there was something standing between he and that victory. And it was the fact that if the sun went down, everybody would flee and he wouldn't win the battle. And so he simply stood and said to the sun, stand still. Because his dream, his destiny, his purpose was written before the foundation of the world. I go across America, and I say that every place I go. Do you realize the purpose, the destiny, the thing that God has prepared for you was written by God before he made the world, before he made matter? And when I think about all that, and as I've traveled across America and signed almost 11,000 books in the last year, of people that said, I want to learn my destiny. And then they say to me, where do I get the money to do that? I sat one day and said, God, where do they get the money? Where do they get that? I'm not sure where they're going to get it. And the Lord said to me, where did you get the millions of dollars that built all the buildings you built? Where did you get the millions of dollars to build churches all over the world? Where did you get that? I said, God, I don't even remember. Where did you find it? And all of a sudden, something came out of deep inside of me. And I said, Lord, I found it inside of me. We'll talk about that in a moment. Here's the questions I want you to answer. The questions I've tried to answer in this book. Ask yourself these questions. Number one, where does money come from? Question number two, what is money? Number three, who owns the wealth of the world? And what does God require of me? Here's the thing. There's destiny inside of you. Written before the foundation of the world. And the same time God did that, he put the creativity for all of that inside of you. Let me tell you a story. I lived with a very creative father. Both of my families were rich on both sides. But there was a crash of 29, and by the time I came along in 1932, everybody was poor. And we had nothing. We were part of the Depression. My dad got saved in 1936 and took the job, because he was in the restaurant business, took the job as the cafeteria manager and the business manager of a Bible school in Springfield, Missouri. He walked into the office of the dean of that school, Brother W.I. Evans, and he said to him, Brother Evans, tell me what my budget is to feed these young people. I've got 550 kids that I have to feed three times a day. How much money do I have to do with it? Because I've got to go buy the food. I've got to figure my budgets. How much money do I have? Brother Evans looked at him and said, Sir, you have eight cents a day. 
for every child. My God's, my dad said, no, this is 1940s. My dad looked at him and said, well, that might buy us macaroni and cheese, but that wouldn't buy us a single piece of meat to feed anybody. And Brother Evans looked at him, and this is what he said to him. Al, if you're going to have the money to feed this body, this body of students anything like meat, then you're going to have to go create the money. My dad walked out of there and says, the Bible gives me power to create wealth. And he thought about that, and he said, God, how am I going to create it? I'd have to work 12 hours a day just to do my job. I can't go out and start a business. Where am I going to get the money to do this? And one day we were going down to Springfield, Missouri, down to have a A&W root beer and a, and a hot dog. And, and uh, we got in our car and drove down through the streets of Springfield. And as we're driving down, uh, down Commercial Street and Boonville Avenue, all of a sudden we were surrounded by huge fire trucks racing to a fire and pulled the car over. And my dad always loved excitement. And, and so the first thing he reacted, let's follow the fire trucks. So we followed the fire trucks. I, don't, I think I followed more fire trucks when I was a kid. Uh, there, you know, we didn't have television in those days. Uh, we didn't go to movies. That was wrong for all of us Assemblies of God people. So, uh, you know, the only th exciting thing we could do is follow fire trucks. So we followed the fire truck, and we got to this fire, and this huge factory was going up in flames. And as it was going up in flames, these huge bolts of, of wool material were falling. The building was coming down, and the material was falling down into this huge lake of water at the bottom of that. And he stood right beside, my dad and I stood right beside Mr. Lurie, who owned the factory. My dad looked at Mr. Lurie and he said, Mr. Lurie, how much will you sell me that material for? Mr. Lurie said, what do you want the material for? First of all, it's soaking wet. You couldn't use it. How would you dry it out? There's thousands of bolts of it. How would you dry it out? My dad said, well, I'll figure that out. Well, even if you dry it out, it's singed on both ends. Who in the world would want to buy it? I think Mr. Lurie forgot that it was the end of World War II, and you couldn't buy wool material any place. So my dad bought the material for a few hundred dollars, got some trucks, and hauled it back to the campus. Everybody thought he was crazy, including Brother Evans. And he hired 15 Bible school students, and he rented 15 acres of property. And day after day, for almost a month, they rolled those bolts of wool material out. Acre after acre of material, 15 acres for a whole month, they dried out that wool material. And my dad sold that material for almost $100,000 and fed those students for a year. Power to create wealth. Now, I don't think any of you are going to chase a fire truck to get wealthy, but there's power inside of you to create wealth. There's destiny, and there's power inside of you to create wealth. If you have a destiny written before creation, and God speaks that destiny in the language of visions and dreams, which he does, let me tell you a few things about money that, that is able to create. Because the, the title of this book is simply this. How do you create wealth to build God's dream? Let me tell you, when I, was, when I came to Buffalo in 1963 to take the church, I had already been a successful evangelist. By the time I'm 26 years of age, I'd pastored the largest Assemblies of God church in the world in Manila, Philippines, the privilege of pastoring Bethel Temple following Lester Summerall. I went from there to Korea, was there the first year that Dr. Cho started building that church and worked with him. Then I came back to Buffalo. When I came back to Buffalo, I took this little church of about 60 people. Their total assets were about $50,000. They had an old Lutheran church. They bought for $50,000. They still owed about 40000 on it. So they, they had at least a little bit of equity. And uh, then they had a parsonage worth maybe ten dollars or $20,000. But the to if you figured everything they had, songbooks, chairs, organ, everything they had, it might have been worth $60,000 total. And I said, God, what am I to do with this? God said the parable of the talents teaches you that you are responsible to grow my wealth. How are you going to grow it? I said, God, I don't know. 
Maybe I'll build a new church someday, which we did. Maybe I'll build branch churches in the city. Maybe I'll build churches across the world. We did all of those things. Today, after 50-some years later, our real estate is worth approximately $45 million, all the churches we have in Buffalo. It's amazing. We're responsible to increase God's wealth. And how do you do that? Well, let me help you with that for a few moments, will you? Uh, First of all, what is money? If you take a bill out of your billfold, what is this stuff called money? It has an interesting thing on it. All of our bills, I'm going to pull out a first bill I find here is a $10 bill. On this bill, on the $1 bill, on the $20 bill, the $50 bill, there is this statement. In God, we trust. In God, we trust. Our forefathers were smart enough to know that we can never trust this stuff. Say it again. We can never trust it. You know, first of all, it's, it, it depreciates with, the, with inflation. Countries go out of business. It, it's possible this $10 bill may be worth about a dollar 20 years from now because you can't trust it. That's why our forefathers said we want to tell people you can't trust in this paper stuff because in God we trust. It is simply a way of measuring. This is like a ruler. If a house you bought yesterday costs, say, $200,000, you measure the value of the house by the money you pay for it. You measure the value of a car. If you drive a Mercedes, maybe it's worth 50000 or 60000 If you drive a new Ford Focus, it may be worth 12000 or 15000 But this measures the worth of things. Measures what you pay for your suit. What's a suit worth? If your suit has a Hart Schaffner and Marx label in it, it's worth more than one that has a Penny's label in it. Uh, it. It measures. It's a measuring stick. And that's about all it is. It, it measures the, the value of things. Whose money is it? I'm going to spend a while here tonight. Whose money, who does this belong to? I've said in this sermon long before Donald Trump was a was a candidate to be president. Donald Trump doesn't, isn't worth any more than you're worth. In fact, he's not worth any more than your little girl's worth. He is worth nothing, zero. Everything Donald Trump thinks he has belongs to God. Maybe someday a preacher will tell him that, but he doesn't own anything. The wealthiest man in the world, Rockefeller, owned nothing. There's not a person in the world. The Queen of England, no matter how... How many, how many palaces she has and how many Rolls Royces she has and, and how, whatever she has, she has nothing. She is worth the same amount of money that you're worth. All of us are worth zero because God owns everything. That's the way the Bible begins. Let me talk to you about that for a moment. The Bible begins with a story that God takes and begins to replenish the earth, puts a garden in the middle of the earth, and says several things to Adam. This is a beautiful garden I'm going to give you. I'm not going to give it to you. I own it. But I'm going to let you use everything in this garden except one tree. Everything else there, you can eat of it, you can use it, you can take a tree and cut it down and build a house. Anything you want to do with it, it's all yours to use except for one item in this garden, and that's one single tree. And that tree is the symbol of my ownership. The way we express the ownership of God is through recognizing that there is a way in which God demands the recognition of his ownership. God says the way you recognize that I own this garden is you don't touch that tree. You don't eat of anything that tree. It's the symbol of my ownership. Let me tell you a story. When I was a little boy, coming out of the Depression, my folks couldn't afford to buy a house, and so they rented a house. The rent in the house in the 1930s was $20 a month. Can you even imagine $20 a month? Rent for the whole month, $20. And every month, my dad would take me by the hand. We would walk out of our house, walk to Mr. Smith's house, rap on the door. Mr. Smith would open the door, and my dad would say, Mr. Smith, I'm here to pay you the rent. Mr. Smith would look at my dad. He'd do several things. First of all, if my dad had mowed the lawn enough, often enough, he would remind him of that. It's my house, keep the lawn mowed. It's my house, 
something happened to the pain on this side, be sure and touch it up, Al. Be sure and take care of my house. You give me the rent, and you have a right to live in it another month. As we would walk home, my father would say, that's the way the tithe works. The tithe that you give to God, you don't give to God, but the tithe that you bring back to God as an act of faith is a symbol of my ownership. That's the way you express to me that I own everything. You will prove to me that Donald Trump knows that when he ties, because it's the expression of the ownership of God. Wow. The story I want to tell you, this story is in the Bible, the story of the city of Jericho. Do you remember the children of Israel coming and God has promised him a land? He's promised Abraham a land. He promised that we read it again today over and over again is this promise, I'll give you a land. God promised him a land. They get to the land and the first thing they find, there are 10 cities in the land. Interesting enough, 10 cities. The first city, the tithe city, the set aside city is Jericho. By a miracle, they get Jericho. And then God says to Abram, or God says to Joshua, Sir, that city is my city because the tithe belongs to me. The first, ten, the first of the ten cities is mine. Don't touch it. Don't eat it. Don't use the gold. Don't use the silver. Take every bit of value in that city and bring it to my house. You can have all the other cities, but that city is mine. And then he says something. It's the accursed city. Did you know one of the Hebrew words for tithe is curse? It's the cursed portion. Jericho was the cursed city. It didn't mean it was the bad city. It doesn't mean it was the evil city. But it was the part set aside as the tithe, and therefore God called it a curse because of the Hebrew word for tithe, one of the words, is, is cursed. And I said, God, what does that mean? What does that really mean? And all of a sudden, the Lord took me to another scripture. The Bible says that Jesus became the curse for us that we might enjoy the blessings of Abraham. Jesus became the curse. He became sin for me. He became sin for me. And God said to me, that's the way it is with a tithe. When you bring the tithe, all the curse that I placed upon the earth when man sinned is now placed upon your tithe that I may release the blessing on the other 90%. Hear me. Did you realize the giving of the tithe is a way to release the blessing of God upon your other 90%? The tithe is the door to blessing. The tithe is the door to blessing. Always remember that. No preacher gets up here and say, bring your tithes because God's going to get you if you don't tithe. No, God already got you. He cursed the earth. You have to work by the sweat of your brow ever since man sinned. The curse is already there. It is removed when you give your tithe to God. That's why I can assure you. We had a man, Malcolm McGregor, come to our church years ago, and he made a covenant with the people. He said, if you don't tithe, if you don't tithe, then tonight, tonight I'm going to ask you to begin. And if you begin to tithe tonight, six months from now, when you don't have more than you have now, I will give you back every cent you gave to God in the tithe, every Cent of it. Now, take a look at the card. Number one, God is the owner of everything. I've already said that. I'm a steward of God's resources. Number two, I told you, and I will tell you in a moment, we have a mandate to increase God's wealth. We'll talk about the parable of the talents in a moment. Wealth is inside of me. God gave you the power to create wealth. We talked about that. Now, I must measure the wealth that God has entrusted to my stewardship. Now, if you're going to make this work, if you're going to make God's economy work in your life, the first thing you're going to have to do is have some kind of way to measure it. How much are you worth? Did you ever sit down and figure that out? I don't know whether anybody's done an asset structure to everything they have, but if it's God, you ought to know how much God is worth in you and through you. How much? How much is your house worth? 
how much of a mortgage you have on it. Subtract your mortgage from its worth. That's your value. How much is your car worth? Maybe you paid $25,000 for your car, but you owe 10000 on it or 5000 on it. It's appreciated so many dollars. Maybe your equity in your car is $5,000 or $6,000. That's part of your wealth. How much money do you have in the bank? Probably most of you don't even know that. How much money do you have in the bank? How much money do you have in stocks and bonds? How much money do you have in furniture that has value? How much money do you have in, in uh, other things, in properties you own? Because in order to understand the parable of the talents, you have to begin with a measuring stick. And in the book, I talk about that. I, I give you ways in the book in, in which you can measure your wealth. Because not only do you have to measure it, but you have to grow it. Here's the parable. Jesus comes to his disciples one day, and this is what he says to them. He says, let me tell you a parable of three men. The first man I gave one talent to. I don't know how much that is, but it's, uh, let's say it's $20,000 or $25,000. To a second man, I give two talents. Maybe that's $50,000. Let's say it's $50,000. To the third, I give a quarter of a million dollars. I give, I give 10 talents. If a talent is 25,000, then I give a quarter of a million. He goes away. And he says, before he goes, you are responsible for my wealth. Be cautious that you don't deteriorate it. Don't let it perish. And I will come back a few years from now, whenever, and I will... Have you measured your wealth for me to see if you've grown it? He comes back. You know the story. You, you could all tell it. The first man, he looks, and the man says, well, you gave me ten talents. You gave me, you gave me five talents. I made them to ten. To another one, you've given me uh, two talents. I've made them four. And the other man, the man said, I knew you were a hard taskmaster, so I took them and hid them. Master, I've got every dime you gave me. And God says something amazing. God says, this has to do with eternity. So the reward which I will take from you and I will give to the one who has increased my talents, I will also make it eternal punishment. In fact, he talks about hellfire. He talks about, he, he, makes, he puts an eternal value on that. And, and then God says in his word, that you'll be rewarded in heaven for the way you've handled earthly things. So the way you handle your wealth is how you'll be rewarded in heaven. That, that's an amazing thing to think about. You know, I have worked with people that have made salaries of a million dollars a year. One of them came to a divorce after he'd made a million dollars a year for 15, 20 years. There wasn't enough money in the estate in the bank to buy his wife a house. How do you spend that much money? Because you think of wealth as, I own a Cadillac, I own a Mercedes, I own this, I own that, I've got this kind of suits, I buy my suits in Italy. What, 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 whatever you do, that's not wealth. Wealth has to do with the measurable assets that God has given you, and it's spiritual to measure them and spiritual to in. Increase them. Just a few more things tonight. Next, God's wealth has a reason. I'm going to spend more time on this tomorrow, but God's wealth has a reason. Do you know one of the reasons God has blessed you? is because you're building a new church. It's one of the reasons for the blessing of God in your life. One of the reasons for the blessing of God in your life is what this church is going to do for this community and this world. That's one of the reasons for your wealth. It's not just to make you feel good, not to make you drive the kind of car you like, not to live in the kind of house you live in. It is to build God's dream. Build God's dream. That's the purpose of wealth. Uh, now, I don't have too much longer tonight because I know we're almost out of time. But if you look at that, if it's God's purpose is to build God's dream, whatever that is, that may be to go as a missionary. That may be to help the poor. That may be to, uh, uh, to do whatever. But 
what is the purpose of God's given you? I know the purpose of what God's given me. The purpose of God's given me, one of the purposes was to publish that book and tell people how they're to use their money, how do they measure their money. I knew that was part of my purpose in life. I had to invest in that. Thank you for buying some books probably at the end of the service and helping me pay the bill. But, but my purpose was to use my money to influence the kingdom of God and influence the world. Now, here's the question. Is that all it's for? Is it only to build churches? Is it only to send missionaries? Is that the only purpose of wealth? No. One of the purposes in wealth is God permits you and gives you the privilege of enjoying the wealth he's given you. Can I tell you a story? When I started the ministry in the 1950s, in, in those days, uh, we don't, didn't have a lot of things we had today. And I was traveling all over the country, and I, I had this dream. You know, evangelists like nice cars because they go from city to city. I guess they fly today, but in those days, we, we drove from city to city. And the car that I dreamed of driving was a Cadillac Eldorado convertible. I tell you, I would have died for that car. And one day, I found one, and I realized that God had blessed me enough to buy it. I remember driving home in that beautiful baby blue Eldorado 1954 Cadillac convertible. I will never forget it. I still like cars. I'll never forget it. I've driven a convertible ever since. I still drive a convertible. Uh, it was something that just was part of my psyche, I guess. I wanted that car. I'll never forget how fulfilled I was when I drove that car in the yard, shut it off, walked into the kitchen, laid the keys on the table, and walked into my bedroom to get my clothes changed because I was going out to do something. And walking back, and I thought, hmm, God, I feel guilty. I feel guilty having that car. I shouldn't have that nice a car. I can't enjoy that. God, maybe I've been unfaithful to you in buying it. Lord, maybe this is wrong that I have it. I can't enjoy it because I don't know if it's even right that I have it. And God said this to me. He said, Tommy, I ask you a question. Number one, whose car is it? I said, it's, it's yours, Lord. He said, then will you make me a promise? The promise is this. If it's mine, whenever I ask you for it, when I ever ask it back, bring it back to me, and I will wish you now to enjoy it. I remember walking back. Those keys were like a, uh, uh, a lighted bonfire on that table. I didn't know whether to like it. I didn't know whether to hate it. I didn't know whether I could enjoy it. I knew nothing. But all of a sudden, they became like a piece of gold. And I picked them up. I remember going outside in the driveway, putting my, my keys in that ignition and starting that big V8 engine and backing out the driveway. It felt so good <laughs> to drive God's car. And God said, enjoy it. But two years later, guess what happened? We were going to the mission field. We were going to the Philippines and Korea, and we didn't have enough money to buy the ticket. And so God says, remember what I told you? I said, yeah, Lord, I remember. I'm trying not to, but I, I, I remember what you told me. And, and I took that car, and I called the Cadillac, Tinny Cadillac in Buffalo, and I had them come and pick it up. It didn't matter what I got for it because it was God's anyway. I remember the tail lights, those that had tail fins in those days, those tail fins driving out the, the, the yard the last time I would ever see that car. My dream. It was gone. And I, I kind of felt bad the next few years. Several things happened that made me feel better, but never had that nice a car all my life. But it was, it was that dream boat that I had. And uh, then one day... I got a call in the 1980s because on that trip, we went to the Philippines and we went to Korea to help Brother Cho start the church. And uh, Brother Cho called and he said, uh, will you bring Wanda and Amy and come and be with us for the 20th anniversary of the church? And I went to the 20th anniversary of the church in Seoul. And I remember service after service, I would preach and I would go outside and I watch 50,000 people go and 50,000 people come preached to something like half a quarter of a million people that day. 
And I sat there saying, boy, I had something to do with starting this. It was small when I left, but I, at least I was there when we started. And I walked out, and I remember this almost like an epiphany. I looked at the bricks of that church, and I went over and put my hand on them. And the Lord said to me, do you see something in those bricks? I said, Lord, what should I be seeing? And the Lord said to me, my Cadillac. You gave it. And this church might not even be here today if you hadn't given it. It belongs to God. It's a wonderful experience to give to God. You can enjoy your wealth. A couple other things closing. I live in a world of abundance, not a world of lack. Not a world of lack. Everything in my world is in abundance. You, you know what? Part of the political arguments are: Do we have enough oil? Do we have enough what? Do we have enough wood? Do we have uh, this argument of lack of resource is constantly around us? And I'm not against ecology and all that. I I believe in that. But here's the interesting thing. We live in a world of abundance. And how do I see it? Because if you live in a world of abundance, you live in a world in which there's sufficient for everything that you need. Now, take the card out and look at the other side. I want you all to make a covenant with God to steward his treasures, his resources. If you've got a pencil or a pen, if not, you can do it when you get home if you don't. But pull, pull one out if you have one. I had to borrow one from my wife tonight. I want you to check these things. This is your covenant. Number one, I believe that it's God's plan to prosper me. I wish I had time tonight because I would tell you that the covenant that God made to prosper Abram was a covenant that God swore by himself. The covenant that God made with you to prosper you is a covenant that God swore by himself. I believe that I'm a steward not of my wealth, but of God's wealth. Number three, I believe I'm mandated to grow God's wealth. I covenant today to manage God's wealth and grow it. I covenant today to leave an inheritance to my church to my family, to my children. I'm not going to spend it all. I'm going to see it grow. Next point. I will expect from this day on miracles in my finances. I will expect today miracles in my finances. When I sow a seed, I'll expect a harvest. When I sow a seed, I will expect a harvest. A few years ago, I was preaching a Benny Hinn meeting. Benny happens to be a young man from my church, so we kind of disciple him and uh, talk to him quite often on the phone and be seeing him next week. But uh, I was going to preach the Friday night service for him. Never know whether I get to do that, but you see, you're preaching tonight, and he told me I was preaching tonight, which I did. Before I approached this evangelist that I don't care too much about, uh, was taking the offering. I listened to him, and he said something I'll never forget. Don't ever sow a seed without expecting a harvest. I'll sow seed and expect a harvest. And my last point. I will covenant to weekly bring my tithe to God's house to acknowledge his ownership. You know what? We're sloppy with that. We make the check for the gas in our house the check for the car payment the check for the house payment before we make our tithe check you need to covenant with God the first check you make out of every increase is your tithe check make it a matter of formality it's a covenant that you make with God if you expect God to bless you now I, I started years ago with 10% I am up to 40 or 45% now but uh, it, it's just, just my belief in this system. Let me close with this statement. Years ago, I backed off from taking a salary from my church about 15 years ago. 
I took a stipend every week of then about $500 a week. Everybody on my staff made more than I made. I said, I want you to prove to them that our resource is not what we make. It's the blessing of God. If you knew how Wanda and I were blessed, you would know that's true. And I want to pray a prayer in closing for the blessing of God upon your life. In the middle of this building program, the blessing of God upon your life, that God will increase the finances, not only of this house, but your finances. Would you stand with me right now? Let me pray for you, will you? Father, in Jesus' name, may the blessing of God come upon these people tonight. May the blessing of the Lord in a dimension they've never known before come upon them. And may they walk out of this house knowing that they're blessed because of the covenant. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn to somebody.